Amen. Thank you, Jonathan, Darlene. Psalm 139 this morning. Psalm 139 and verse 14. Psalm 139, verse 14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. We're going to be talking about the eye this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. Pray that you would work through the preaching of your word this morning, that you would speak to hearts, that you might be glorified in Jesus' name, amen. Some of you probably thought we were done with this series, but you were wrong. This is a series that refuses to die. (laughs) We've looked thus far at birds and insects and outer space and mammals and fish and reptiles and plants and the water and the weather and Noah's Ark and the flood. Today and for the rest of this series, we will look at man. Now, this series will be intermittent or occasional to give the producer a break. There's the producer, my wife. (laughs) She told me to tell you that I made her put her picture in here. So I'm telling you that I I made her put her picture in here. This is her college picture. But she's the one that produces this and takes a lot of time. So we'll get to this about once a month. As incredible and remarkable as birds and fish and insects and mammals and reptiles are, man is all the more incredible and remarkable. Man is greater than the greatest mountains or oceans. Augustine said, men go abroad to wonder at the height of mountains, at the huge waves of the sea, at the long courses of the rivers, at the vast compass of the ocean, at the circular motion of the stars, and they pass by themselves without wondering." Man is the pinnacle of God's creation. He is not an animal. He is different in many ways from the animal world. In Genesis 1, 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Man alone was created in the image of God. Man alone was given an eternal soul. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for man alone. There's remarkable variety and beauty that is evident in the animal world. But animals are still just animals. Now, I know there are people who disagree with that. You can have your little poodle eat at your table if you want and sleep in your bed. And you can knit him little sweaters and let him ride in the front seat of the car while your husband has to ride in the back. And you can go get his hair permed and his nails done, but... He's still just a dog. And he's not going to heaven when he dies. Not even to doggy heaven. Before Christmas one year, I heard a pet expert on the radio talking about how people without thinking leave their pet out on Christmas. Not as in outside, but they leave them out. They don't buy them presents. And no joke. He said that the pet can feel very hurt if that they don't get presents to open. And that may well be, but you know, my dogs have never bought me Christmas presents either. (laughs) And so they're just going to have to learn to deal with the hurt. Besides, we not only leave them out, we leave them outside, so they're not even, they don't even know what's going on, actually. But this pet expert on the radio went on to say that a very meaningful gift to give your pet would be a gift certificate to get neutered. (laughs) Seriously. First of all, my dogs can't even read. Secondly, even if they could read, I'm not sure they'd understand. And thirdly, if they could read and understand, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't appreciate it. (laughs) They'd probably just chew up the gift certificate. But a while back, they surveyed people and asked them if their dog and a total stranger were both drowning and they could only save one, which one would they choose, the dog or the man? And an alarmingly high percentage said their dog. An animal is just an animal. Don't mistreat them, but man has an eternal soul. And one human being, for the record, is worth more than all the spotted owls that have ever lived. 
And God in his wisdom put so much into his creation of man that it literally defies comprehension. In fact, we'll spend a few messages on man and really only scratch the surface. There are so many things we take for granted that are amazingly complex. Consider your eyes this morning. Eyes are mentioned more than 500 times in the Word of God. Sir Charles Sherrington, a widely respected scientist in his day, wrote, Behind the intricate mechanism of the human eye lies breathtaking glimpses of the master plan. In the dark, the sensitivity of the human eye increases 10,000 times. The eye can detect a faint glow less than one one-thousandth as bright as a candle's glow. It can discern light from the stars, the nearest of which is trillions and trillions of miles away. To see the image focused on the lens of the to, fo- to see the image focused on the lens of the eye falls on the screen at the back of the eyeball, the retina. The retina has about 130 million cells. Science Digest states that from the vast panorama presented by your eyes, each one can send an estimated 1 billion impulses per second to your brain, and then your mind sorts it out and chooses significant details. You have approximately 100 billion neurons in your brain. Each of these neurons has approximately 10,000 branching fibers connecting it with other neurons. The neurons in your brain were made into a chain. It would stretch two million miles, just the ones in your brain. A single nerve can carry up to a 1,000 separate impulses per second. Your body contains approximately 100 trillion cells, which all work in coordinated harmony together. Five trillion chemical operations occur in your brain every second. Your mind is a pretty busy place. A lot of busyness, a lot of that busyness comes from visual messages. Now there's a pretty good chance that you take all of that for granted and don't give it much thought or appreciation. But it is actually an incredibly complex and highly advanced thing that your eyes do. It is an acquired and developed skill that God enabled you to perfect when you were young. The capabilities to do so are at their optimum level when you are a young child. Robert Curson writes, neurons are a particular type of nerve cell designed to process and transmit electrical impulses. Some of these neurons transmit signals from the world outside, bringing signals to the brain from the eyes, ears, fingers, and even the stomach wall. Oof, I ate too much. But the majority of neurons receive, modify, and pass along signals from other neurons. Each neuron forms thousands of connections with other neurons, meaning that the number of possible combinations between them is greater than the number of elementary particles in the universe. It is thought that the brains of humans and their network of neurons are the most complex structures in the universe. Particular connections between neurons are what give rise to particular sensations, perceptions, feelings, thoughts, memories. Everything a person experiences remembers, and feels. When a person perceives a banana, it is a result of electrical impulses traveling first from the eye to the brain, and then through a very particular network of neurons that have been formed to recognize and react to bananas. These banana neurons, as we might call them, are created and strengthened by our experience with bananas. Neurons and connections for recognizing Uncle Joe are created and strengthened by experience with Uncle Joe. Forming particular neural networks is what we call learning. We form particular neural networks to represent everything we experience in the world, including faces, depth, objects, motion, and color. To learn something as staggeringly complex as vision, with all its subtleties, shadows, cues, clues, priors, exceptions, contexts, and confusions, a person needs massive amounts of neurons available and ready for that purpose. But who owns a supply like that? Young children do. Consider the enormous learning of which young children are capable, he writes. Compared with adults, for example, they learn, a lang- they learn language at a staggering rate. Such learning is made possible in the very young by huge stores of available neurons that are awaiting assignment. In fact, children have an overabundance of available neurons for learning. Those that don't get used actually die as the baby becomes a small child. Adults, however, don't have that kind of ready supply of neurons available for learning. Nor, it seems, do adult neurons form connections with other neurons as quickly and easily as do young child 
neurons. That's why adults simply can't learn like children do. A powerful example of this is language learning. An adult who learns a language will never be as fluent as a person who learned that language in childhood. In most cases, a native speaker can tell the difference between another native speaker and an expert later learner. A linguist can tell in every case. Another example can be seen in cases of early brain damage. Frighteningly large chunks of brain are often removed from small children because of tumors or epilepsy, sometimes almost half the brain. That kind of brain loss in an adult would cause a severe handicap. The person might never walk or speak properly again. But in small children, the brain can reorganize to make the best use of the remaining neurons. Remember, there are a hundred billion of them. Often after a few years, these children show no sign that a large part of their brain is missing. At just a few months old, infants start grabbing for objects. At first, their attempts are clumsy and awkward, but it doesn't take them very long to become very adept at depth perception. Using the visual clues all around them, they adjust and learn at astonishing speed. The task is actually very difficult. Uh, Engineers still can't design machines that can compute depth as accurately in a variety of applications as human beings can. Yet the child learns to do it without any formal education, simply from interacting with his environment. There are a few people, very few, who have had surgery to give them sight or restore sight after many years or a lifetime of going blind. Now, you would think that that would be a tremendous gift, an incredible opportunity to be able to see after being blind for so long, some of them almost their entire lives. And surprisingly, it doesn't work out that way from the recipient's standpoint. In the book, Crashing Through, the author writes about a man named Mike May who had his sight restored through surgery. And the book uh, cites many other cases as well. A 52-year-old man named Sidney Bradford had his sight surgically restored. He had lost it at 10 months of age. So he'd lived 51 years, two months of his life blind, only 10 months seen, and at the age of 52, he got his sight back. Two psychologists, Richard Gregory and Gene Wallace, worked with him after his surgery. And, And though he could make no sense of faces, Bradford found his own to be repulsive. And he found his wife's to be ugly. Uh, He was greatly let down, he told Wallace, to discover his wife wasn't as beautiful as he'd expected. He continued to note the imperfections and the things he saw and to express disappointment that the world was not uh, as he wished when he was happier in times when he was a different man. We formed a strong impression that his sight was to him almost entirely disappointing, Gregory would later write. He was not a man to talk freely, but was obviously depressed, and we felt that he had lost more than he had gained by recovery of sight. Bradford's depression deepened. In a letter to Gregory, his wife wrote, he is very disappointed about everything. And six months later, she wrote, he is not any better. I wish you could help him. It seems to, our, to me our world is not as grand as we thought. On August the 2nd, 1960, just 19 months after his second surgery, Bradford died. He was 54 years old and had been perfectly fit. To Gregory's mind, and he was certain of it, Bradford had just simply given up and let go. And that's not an isolated example. Most patients become depressed, a fate that few seem to escape. Uh, Marius von Sending collected the bulk of the case histories in his book Space and Sight, and he writes, it also emerges from the reports as a whole that the process of learning to see in these cases is an enterprise fraught with innumerable difficulties. And that the common idea that the patient must necessarily be delighted with the gifts of light and color bequeathed to him by the operation is wholly remote from the facts. Alberto Valvo in his pamphlet, Sight Restoration After Long-Term Blindness, observed one of the most striking overall findings is that patients recovering sight often suffer from depression and tend to regress to behavior characteristics of their blind period. The words of the subjects themselves convey the nature of their crises. How come it is that I now find myself less happy than before, one 14-year-old girl asked her father. Everything that I see causes me a disagreeable emotion. Oh, I was so much more at ease in my blindness. I still often have fits of crying, wrote a 38-year-old man. I don't know why, unless perhaps because I have seen too much during the day. In the evening, I prefer to stay in a darkened room like a crying baby. This is too long and unhappy a road, leading one into a strange world. The man dreamed of, he said, significant aggressiveness toward the surgeons who had given him vision. 
He was that upset at getting vision. He wanted to hurt the surgeons that had given it to him. One 25-year-old man wrote, I still have the painful feeling that I'm not up to the task of returning completely to seeing, and I do not know whether I shall be able to manage it. Robert Kirsten writes, the despair was not lost on those who had studied these patients. He said, the case histories are rife with phrases like, lost all her good humor as soon as she was compelled to see, ever more disillusioned in his hopes, and would sooner not see at all. Of his 50-year-old subject, renowned neurologist Oliver Sacks wrote, he found himself between two worlds, at home in neither, a torment from which no escape seemed possible. One of the reasons for all of the misery with those who are given sight is that they cannot process all of the visual stimuli that flood and overwhelm their brains. They become overwhelmed with all of the signals that are constantly fed to their brains on an ongoing basis. Those one billion impulses per second cause system overload. Many of them honestly feel safer crossing the street with their eyes closed than with their eyes open after having their sight restored because they can make sense of all the sounds, but they can't make sense of all the sights. It's a distraction that causes them danger. And for Mike May, he said the idea of seeking to be able to see felt like seeking to get a divorce. A divorce from the blind community and a divorce from his whole life to that point. It is believed that more than one-third of the human brain is involved with vision. A fact that manifests how incredibly intricate and how unbelievably complex vision is. They tell us your eyes make millions of calculations and adjustments every second. The process of seeing involves a network of connections far more extensive than any communication system in the largest cities in the world. The eye's lenses change its curvature to focus on objects near or distant. The pupil is self-adjusting. Those adjustments are automatic, requiring no thought or no conscious decision for someone who has had sight their entire life. The complexity of perceptual cells that enable us to see is an incredible thing. 127 million cells called rods and cones line up in rows as, as the seeing elements of, uh, that receive light and transmit messages to the brain. Rods are slender cells that reach out toward the light and they outnumber the cones 120 million to 7 million. And those rod cells are so sensitive that the smallest measurable unit of light, one photon, can activate them. Under optimum conditions, the human eye can detect a candle at a distance of 15 miles. However, with rods alone, we would uh, only see shades of gray and black, and we would not get the resolution and detail that the more complex cones provide. In that sea of rods, the cones tend to uh, concentrate in the precise spot in the eye where focusing is most acute. Cones are 1,000 times less sensitive to light. And yet they make possible the perception of color and fine details. Our assortment of rods and cones lets us see things at the end of our noses and things that are miles away. How does the process of sight work? Well, light streaming through the sky bounces off external objects and enters the eye. To that extent, the eye opens like a camera with precise shutter and focusing mechanisms to admit and record the light. A variable pinhole lets in mountains and trees, skyscrapers and clouds, an elephant, and even a tiny flea. When light is entering into the eye, it passes first through the cornea. The cornea is a tiny part of your body, but it does major work. The cornea is a circular layer of transparent flesh, one-fiftieth of an inch thick at the very front of your eye. And it allows light to enter, and it does the majority of the focusing. And just as you need to keep your car's windshield clean to be able to see, to drive, so your cornea must stay clear and clean. So the ability of the eye to see is highly dependent upon each highly specialized corneal cell to control its own absorption of water and nutrients and oxygen. Each cell does that. It's a, mini, a miniature factory all on its own. The iris contracts and dilute, dilates to regulate the passage of light to the back of the eye. It is said to be the most data-rich structure in the entire body. By way of comparison, a fingerprint displays 35 different identifiable characteristics. Your fingerprint has 35 different identifiable characteristics. The iris of your eye has 266 different identifiable characteristics. 
Those of you that travel internationally know a lot of the countries of the world now are using that iris identification to, uh, to identify you when you go into that country. Once the physical image reaches uh, the retina, the activity of the eye ceases to be like a camera. For there on, everything is like electricity. And technically, we do not actually see with the eye, but rather with the help of the eye. Just like the images transmitted back to Earth by many of the spacecraft during the last few years are actually reconstructions by computers of thousands of bits of information so that in all actuality you have not seen, for instance, Jupiter, but electronically enhanced reproductions of data about Jupiter that have been converted uh, into a computer program. Similarly, our brains do not receive photographic images of anything. Rather, some of the 127 million rods and cones get excited or activated by light waves and they fire off messages into the one million uh, fibers of the optic nerve, which coils like a thick cable back into the inner recesses of the brain. And impulses from the retina race along the fibers of the optic nerve, they fan out in the brain, and finally enter into the visual cortex, stimulating the miracle of sight. The, the cortex has to process an estimated one billion, one billion with a B, impulses per second coming in from the retina. Only in the past several years have scientists begun to understand how the process of sight actually works. A great deal of research has gone in recent years using anesthetized animals. Uh, in, in, uh, it has given a great deal of insight into how the visual cortex sorts out and responds to these electrical sim- signals. They've opened up animals' heads, and after locating the visual cortex in the brain, they attach an unimaginably slender microelectrode to a single brain cell. And then they'll place a variety of different shapes and sizes and movements and patterns of light before the animal's eye, and then they meticulously record which objects or which patterns uh, cause that particular cell to fire off or to respond to that visual stimuli. The receptor uh, field of any particular cell is very narrow and very particular, It may fire only when a horizontal bar at a 30-degree angle is placed in front of the animal. Some cells only fire when a large spot is placed in front of the animal's eye. And some some cells only fire when it's a small spot. Some cells respond only to light. And some cells respond only to motion. Some only to dark. And some only to stationary items. And uh, some only record, record the boundary regions between light and dark and so on. But you put all of that together... And you have the miracle of sight that we take for granted. The Nobel Prize winning scientist who first charted these patterns in the brain cortex stated that the number of neurons responding successively as the eye watches a slowly rotating propeller is scarcely imaginable. It's a mind-boggling thought that when we see, we are totally unconscious of the process of cells encoding data and firing in response to it and then decoding and resembling it within the brain. When you go outside and you look at Mount Baldy, for instance, it comes to your consciousness not as a series of dots and light flashes, but as a mountain, whole and entire and intelligible and complete with meaning. So the very ability to transpose units of messages into higher strata of meaning is only possible because of the inner functions of your secluded brain. The cells inside that sheltered mass have no immediate experience of light and dark and shape and form or size or depth, yet every bit of data transmitted uh, to your, by your eyes terminates there. And then no sensation actually can tr- uh, truly register until the brain has taken hold of it, registered it, translated it, made sense of it. And how that works is still a complete mystery to man. And yet we know that it does work. Our eyes take up only about 1% of the weight of our heads, and yet how important and valuable that 1% is. In fact, just your eyeball, as incredibly complex as it is, weighs only about one ounce. To protect those valuable instruments, God has given us eyelids that open and close some 30,000 times a day. If you live to be 80, your eyelids will have opened and closed some 330 million times without breaking down. And without your conscious attention, fortunately. Those shutters wash the windows of your eyes clean every few seconds by painting the surface with fresh salt water. If they didn't, you'd go blind. In fact, that's one of the problems leprosy patients and some of the other patients suffer from because they forget to blink. And so it causes tremendous problems. But it's much more complex than that. Your eyes actually produce three different types of tears. 
Each type of tear serves a different purpose and is composed of, diff- of a different complex formula of ingredients. Uh, there are basal tears, which are the normal everyday lubricating tears that keep the eyes clear of dust. And these are replenished every time you blink and contain lysozyme, which fights against bacterial infection. Your body has a multi-layered defense system, which fights against infectious de- invaders on all fronts. Your body also produces on demand what are called reflex tears. These tears use a different type of ingredients and are produced to flush the eyes of irritants like onion and pepper vapors or smoke or pungent smells, which would irritate the eye. And then you have a third type of tears, uh, emotional tears, again, a different chemical composition and produced when necessary. Emotional tears actually contain a natural painkiller and calming hormones. That's one reason why you often feel better after a good cry. Only humans produce these tears, which fall when you are sad or in pain or even when you're happy, which serves to make you even happier. The tears themselves are made up of three layers. There's an outer layer which contains oils that help slow down evaporation and control the flow of tears onto your cheeks. There's a middle layer which contains proteins and hormones and a mucus layer which touches the eye itself and serves to coat the cornea and ensures even distribution of the tear film. Is it any wonder that David said, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. But it's even more detailed and wondrous than that. There are some special cells that are called corneal epithelial stem cells. Don't worry, there won't be a test. And these are cells that exist in your body your whole life long. And these cells exist along the edges of your cornea. There are about a thousand of them that hang out around there. And these stem cells produce voluminously, resulting in millions and millions of offspring cells. And these offspring cells exist for one purpose to migrate toward the center of your eye, covering your cornea in a transparent, sheer, protective film. This layer of transparent film is your eye's primary protection against dirt and infection and scrapes and scratches. It prevents blood vessels and cells from the white part of the eye from growing over the cornea and blowing, uh, blurring or blocking your vision. This protective film over your eyes gets dirty from time to time. But every few days, those offspring cells Uh, that is made up of die off, and they're replaced by new cells. And through this ongoing process, the covering over your eye is continually rejuvenated and made fresh and clear and new. The parent stem cells that reside along the edges of your cornea keep producing the offspring cells as long as you live. Those cells never die. The cells they produce off die every few days, and the process keeps on going. It wasn't until the 1960s that scientists understood anything about the existence or the absolute necessity of the corneal epithelial stem cells, but they've been there all along, faithfully producing uh, the the offspring cells, performing their sight-maintaining functions year after year after year so that you can continue to see. The cornea's ability to resist disease and trauma is a thing of wonder. Your cornea consists of five layers. Within one layer, it's said that the endothelial cells are able to recognize disease and trauma at a relative distance that is said to be the equivalent of a mother in New York City responding to her child crying in San Diego. These forewarned cells then begin constructing a new protective barrier on the back surface of the cornea and serve as a preemptive repair mechanism to help prevent perforation. He's truly a fool who says there is no God. Charles Darwin knew that the eye alone was enough to discredit and derail his theory of evolution. He admitted in his books that for the eye to have evolved appeared impossible. He said that just to think about the eye and how it could possibly have been produced by natural selection was enough to make him ill. He wrote to Asa Gray in 1860, he said, the thought of the eye made me cold all over. He also said this, to suppose that the eye with all its inimitable inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. I agree. To suppose that the eye evolved is absurd in the highest degree. You look at that word inimitable, that means it's incapable of being imitated. Even Darwin, as he looked at the eye, said that this is incapable of being imitated. There's nobody could imitate this. Robert Jastrow, also an evolutionist, said this, the eye appears to have been designed. No designer of telescopes could have done better. 
And, and all of that takes place without us even thinking about it. But for the person who has been blind since birth or early childhood and then has his sight restored or given to him through surgery, he does have to think about it. And that's, that's one way we can even understand how complicated the process is. And he has to think about it constantly. It's an exhausting process for him. He will never become proficient. It is a continual struggle to perceive depth and distance and space and to understand simple objects. Oftentimes, people that have been blind and had their sight restored when presented with an object will close their eyes and feel them so that they can understand the object because by looking at them, they don't understand them. Their vision is confusing, it's exasperating, it's exhausting. It is an uninterrupted torrent of signals and clues that they find impossible to sort through and to interpret And the only way for them to find relief is to close their eyes. You and I have been given such a gift to be able to see. And all of the adjustments we can just make automatically. For people who have been able to see their whole lives, vision is seemingly effortless. It's automatic. But for a surgically, uh, those with surgically granted sight, seeing and processing and responding is a constant struggle. Involving intense concentration For those who've gone through it, they often liken it to learning a second language as an adult, especially in the early stages when you're trying to learn a second language. Languages, uh, the the sentences just don't flow freely from your tongue. You have to give it great thought. You have to focus on the subject and think of the vocabulary words you need and then try to form an intelligent sentence. And even with all of that intense effort, you'll probably use wrong tenses and words and and, uh, put things in wrong order and all of that on a regular basis. Well, you take that strain multiplied uh, many, many times, uh, hundreds of times. That's what a person with restored vision feels like every waking moment of the day when he's trying to see. And that constant strain coupled with the frustration of overload and fatigue leads to deep depression and suicidal thoughts in many with restored sight. To have to constantly, consciously process a zillion visual clues and to begin to make sense of the confusing, ever-changing mosaic of colors and shapes and shadows and tones and distance and scale and perspective, to do that all day long ensures continual fatigue for them. Added to that is the common disappointment of misreading and misinterpreting those visual clues that seem so basic to us. It's interesting that optical illusions don't have uh, near as much effect on formerly blind individuals because they don't pick up on all the, all the visual clues that we do. For instance, and you may have seen this uh, optical illusion to a normally sighted person, he would look and say, well, the table on the left, that's longer and thinner as far as the table top than the table on the right. But the truth is they're the exact same size. And a person that has restored sight looks at that picture and says the, the tabletops are the exact same size. Because they don't pick up on all those visual clues that we do for depth perception and perspective and all of that. Everything's just just black and white to them. But they truly are. Those tabletops are the exact same size. There's other uh, illusions that they don't pick up on. To them, they they would not see uh, what's what's unusual there. You and I would say, "Uh, something, something funny about that picture. There's another one there for you. You see a profile or or, uh, half a face. Here's one for you. That's actually a flat floor. Those people aren't standing on the side of the building there. It's just been painted to look that way. There's another look. at That, that person's not standing on the side of a building. That's a flat floor. That's a sidewalk art. That's a flat surface. There's another flat surface. That isn't a, a big uh, ice glacier that just gave way there in the road. There's a lady walking on it so you can see. There's one. If you look at that, you should be able to see that pulsing but uh, a person whose sight has been restored, that, that's a constant. They won't see the, the motion there. It's, it's really not moving. That's, that's just your eyes are doing that, making those, those adjustments. There's another one that, I don't, that won't show up as well on the screen. You have to be pretty close to that, but everything looks like it's in motion, looks like it's moving if you're fairly close to the screen for that. We've spent all our time this morning in just one area, and there's a reason for that. Unfortunately, I don't know what it is. No, actually, seriously... <laughs> Seriously, we're dealing in this series with evidence for a creator God and the evidence against evolution. The evolutionist teaches that way back down the evolutionary chain, early primitive life had uh, soft areas or sunspots on their heads, and over the process of time, they evolved into eyes. Of course, with no eyelids, they would have gone blind as soon as they produced even a rudimentary eye. 
uh, the whole theory of evolution is fraught with, with uh, uh, lies and, and, and holes and gaps that they can't possibly explain. But supposedly these creatures gave birth to offspring that picked up where they, le- where they left off. And those eyes became increasingly complex until now you have human eyes with 127 million cones and rods that are able to do what we've discussed this morning. Well, there are some serious and impossible hurdles for the evolutionist to overcome to maintain his theory. His theory is destroyed in light of the evidence. When it comes to animal eyes that are supposedly precursors to human eyes, the facts are all against him, all against the evolutionist. There are a variety of unique eye designs in nature and a few basic types Without going into a lot of detail, since we're primarily dealing with human eyes, there's a kind of eye referred to as a camera eye with a convex lens to refract images. Other creatures have eyes that use reflective mirror lenses. There's a pinhole eye that uses concave lenses. Brian Thomas writes, similar eye designs occur in animals from very different groups. Eye designs crisscross imagined evolutionary tree branches. Those branches should show similar designs within similar groups. Instead, animals within one group use very different and always fully formed eyes. And secondly, certain animals from very different groups share the same basic eye structure. So he goes on to write, neither observation fits the expected evolutionary pattern. This forces proponents to speculate that the same eye designs evolved multiple times in separate organisms. But this assertion lacks an important detail. Evidence. That's what he writes. Typically, magic words like emerge, evolve, and appear substitute for evidence or for a realistic explanation of each supposed gradual step in eye evolution. You know, it takes a lot of faith to believe in evolution. Why are some people in the face of abundant evidence to the contrary so determined to believe and prove evolution? Simply because they don't like the alternative. Now, the evolutionist, because as the Bible says, is a fool... Because he wants so badly for them not to be a God, for there not to be a God, oftentimes makes a very ignorant statement in regards to the eye. And Christopher Hitchens, in his book, God is Not Great, imagine writing that book and one day standing before God. But he wrote the book, God is Not Great. He says that the magnificent, irreducible complexity of the human eye is not evidence for a creator, but cites the ineptitude of its design as proof for evolution. He quotes Dr. Michael Shermer, who claims that a simple eye spot with a handful of light-sensitive cells developed into a recessed eye spot, then into a pinhole camera eye, then into a pinhole lens, then into a complex eye. Shermer goes on to say, the anatomy of the human eye, in fact, shows anything but intelligence in its design. It is built upside down and backwards, requiring photons of light to travel through the cornea, lens, aqueous fluid, blood vessels, ganglion cells, amacrine cells, horizontal cells, and bipolar cells before they reach the light-sensitive rods and cones that transduce the light signal into neural impulses, which are then sent to the visual cortex at the back of the brain. Hitchens says it is because we evolved from sightless bacteria now found to share our DNA that we are so myopic. We must never forget Charles Darwin's injunction that even the most highly evolved of us will continue to carry the indelible stamp of their lowly origin. Now, there are a lot of people who will read stuff like that and just assume that Christopher Hitchens and Michael Shermer know what they're talking about. The truth is they have no idea what they're talking about. Their evolutionary bias blinds them, no pun intended, to the truth. First of all, just being aware of what your eyes can do and experiencing the incredible gift of sight should be enough for any sane person to realize that his eyes were not designed poorly, but also there is zero evidence for their wild guesses, no transitional fossils, no evidence of any kind, uh, no, no evidence in any area for their wild guesses about eye spots and light-sensitive cells developing into complex uh, uh, up to pinhole eyes and pinhole cameras and then into complex eyes. Ask them for any proof whatsoever for their theories, and they cannot give it to you because they have none. Zero evidence. They just make all these pronouncements. Because, uh, you know, he's a scientist, or he's an expert, or he, he's an author, he's a PhD, he's a, he's a professor at a prestigious university. He must know what he's talking about. They have zero evidence. None. Ask him for it. They have none. They just make all of these uh, statements, and people read them in their books and say, well, they must know what they're talking about. Dr. George Marshall is an ophthalmologist, and he is a true expert on the subject of eyes. It's what he's given his life study to. He's also the Sir Jules Thorne lecturer in ophthalmic science at the University of Glasgow. He states, the belief that the eye is wired backward comes from a lack of knowledge. 
of eye function and anatomy. This is an eye expert saying, hey, Michael Shermer doesn't have any idea what he's talking about. Christopher Hitchens doesn't have any idea what he's talking about in his blasphemous book. The nerves could not go behind the eye because that space is reserved for the choroid, which provides the rich blood supply needed for the very metabolically active retinal pigment epithelium. This is necessary to regenerate the photoreceptors and to absorb excess heat, so the nerves must go in front instead. Inverted wiring is necessary for vertebrate eyes to work. The direct opposite of what evolutionists claim would be the correct wiring. In fact, the evolutionist claim is actually undercut by their own assessment of squid eyes, which despite being wired correctly, as they would say, don't see as well as vertebrate eyes. Interestingly, anyone with excellent eyesight is said to have eyes like a hawk, which are backwardly wired, not eyes like a squid. The excellent sight provided by these allegedly wrongly wired eyes makes evolutionist, evolutionist objections absurd. The claim that the nerves obstruct the light has been falsified by very new research by scientists at Leipzig University. Not only is the inverted wiring of our eyes a good design necessary for proper functioning, but it is also coordinated with an ingenious fiber optic plate, so the vertebrate eye has the advantage of a rich blood supply behind the receptors without the disadvantage of nerves blocking out light. Such fine coordination of parts makes sense with a master coordinator while it's a puzzle for the evolutionists. Ophthalmologists have pointed out how the evolutionist idea of a perfect eye is what is backward. What they propose simply won't work. Dr. Jonathan Safardi says that one of their proposals was as useless as an eye with a hemorrhage. Their other ideas were similarly dismissed. Again, Dr. Safardi says some evolutionists claim that the cephalothe eye is somehow right with nerves behind the receptor. But no one who has actually bothered to study those eyes would, could make such claims with integrity. In fact, cephalopods don't see as well as humans. And the octopus eye structure is totally different and much simpler. It's much more like a compound eye with a single lens. Ophthalmologist Peter Gurney gives a detailed response to the question, is the inverted retina really bad design? He addresses the claim that the blind spot is bad design by pointing out that the blind spot occupies only 0.25% of the visual field and is far from the visual axis. So the alleged defect is only theoretical, not practical. The blind spot is not considered handicap enough to stop a one-eyed person from driving a private motor vehicle. The main problem with only one eye is the lack of stereoscopic vision, not any blind spot. There are so many incredible things about the eye, and that's with just what we know about the eye. There are probably thousands and thousands of things that we don't know about the eye. There is a process that your eye has which scientists call edge extraction. It's something that your retina does automatically that enhances the edges of objects, thus making it easier for you to differentiate between the edge of one object and another so that everything doesn't blur together into one fuzzy mosaic like people that have their sight restored have that problem. Now these subtle things that your eyes do that are so sophisticated, highly developed, someone who gets their, eyes, their eyesight later in life won't have those abilities that we just take for granted and we have taken for granted our whole life long. In light of what we've talked about this morning, Psalm sums up the issue very nicely. You fools, when will ye be wise? He that planted the ear shall he not hear? He that formed the eye shall he not see? He that chastiseth the heathen shall not he correct? He that teacheth man knowledge shall not he know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man. The alternative to evolution is to believe that we were created by Almighty God. A God who could come up with something as miraculous as the human eye can surely see everything we do. A God who can create the human ear can surely hear everything we say. A God who created the human brain surely does know the thoughts of man. When we acknowledge these things, there are some considerations and some consequences that affect our lives. Psalm 100 verse 3, know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. There is accountability to God if he made us. Genesis 16, 13, thou, God, seest me. Psalm eleven four. 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. Dr. John Stevens, an associate professor of physiology and biomedical engineering, stated that it would take a minimum of 100 years of a cray supercomputer's time to simulate what takes place in your eye many times each second. 
And your eye needs only a tiny fraction of the energy that the supercomputer needs to function. Jeremiah 23, 24, can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord. Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Psalm 33, 13 and 14, the Lord looketh from heaven, he beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. So what hope is there for us this morning? Especially since Psalm 5 tells us that thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. And yet he's a God that sees everything. Have you ever sinned? God sees it. God knows. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. So what is our problem? We're sinners. We've sinned. And God knows it. And we have no place or way of escape. Isaiah 59, 2, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. But Isaiah 55, 6 and 7 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous men his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon That's what you need this morning from a God who sees and hears and knows everything. You need to be abundantly pardoned. Isaiah 118, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. This same God who formed your eyes and sees even your heart this morning says, if you'll come to me, I'm not going to overlook your sin." I'm going to wash it away. That's what you need this morning. If you're not saved, that's what you need. That's your most desperate need. You say, I need the money for next year's, for next month's rent. I I need the money to put gas in my car. I need a good job. No, your greatest need is to have your sins washed away. Your greatest problem is a sin problem. And if you die in that condition, one day you'll stand before Almighty God. Be separated from him forever in a place called hell. That's not God's design. That's not his desire. He says, why will you die? Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. He said, I will abundantly pardon. If you're not saved, your greatest need is to come to a God who's seen everything you've done, but is still willing to wash away your sin if you'll let him. If you are saved, what are you using your eyes for? Those tremendous gifts from Almighty God. What are you using those eyes for? Do you use them to read your Bible? Do you use them to see your way to come to visitation? Or do you let them rot out watching five hours of TV a day? Or three hours a day on Facebook? What a miracle God has given to us. What a pity if we take the miracle of sight and and use it to look upon pornography or to covet what other people have or, or to cheat or to fill our minds with vanity. What a shame if we sit around and mope because our eyes are brown instead of blue or we don't, th- we don't thank God that we can see. Oh, that we would learn to be thankful for what we do have instead of worrying about what we don't have. It has been said he is only poor who wants what he does not have. Those who die without Christ are poor indeed, whether they realize it at this point or not. Oh, if you've never been saved, I'm going to invite you this morning to come to the one who's seen everything you've ever done and yet is willing to wash your sin away if you'll come. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the gift of sight. Thank you for the health and strength you've given us to be here. Lord, I pray that you'd bless this invitation time, that you'd work in hearts and lives in Jesus' name. Amen.